So thanks so much for that, Joanna. Um, you've brought an industrial biotech perspective that we've not yet heard very much about so far at GAP Summit. Um, so we've got some questions that have come through from readers of tomorrow um, that I'd like to pose to you. Um, the first of these is, what or who are the main political pressure points to increase the economic incentive to develop novel industrial biotechnologies? Oh, that's a, that's a really good <laughs> It's quite, quite a difficult question. Um, I mean, political pressure points, I would say, it, from, a, from a European perspective, and here where I, where I am in Brussels, um, we often have a lot of contact with um, the Directorate General for Research and Innovation. Um, and one of the big mil milestones that we, we crossed in 2012 was the creation of a, a new public-private partnership for bio-based industries, which is all obviously enabled by industrial biotech. So that um, was launched in, um, in 2012 um, to the tune of 3.7 um, billion euros. So that probably, and the discussions that went on in creating that, really helped bring to the fore the enabling potential of industrial biotech. And there were many discussions that happened in, in that context um, to, with different parts of, uh, of the political process. So the industrial part, uh, the research part, the agricultural part, the environmental part. Um, so I would say those sectors still remain the ones who are really uh, probably most easily engaged when it comes to industrial biotech. There is an understanding that um, in agriculture, industrial biotech has a, a big role to play, not just things like biostimulants, but also in terms of um, the incentives for primary producers to get involved in industrial biotech. In environmental, environmental obviously as well, there's uh, bioremediation that people would be aware of um, and many other applications which are more resource efficient when, when you're using industrial biotech. So um, I would say that um, those kind of areas, including the industrial policy sectors, are the ones where perhaps industrial biotech resonates the most with them because they can kind of understand it and see the potential of it to create new solutions. But now we're looking, obviously, everybody is looking a lot at the sustainable development goals and how do we get there. People are looking at the climate goals, the new green deal that the EU is proposing. So there's a lot of areas, policy areas, where industrial biotech slots in pretty well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um... Well, your expertise is obviously in the EU, but someone has asked whether, in addition to the EU, whether you know what progress is being made to, to, to an internationally aligned effort. With, with industrial biotech specifically? Within industrial biotech. Um, it's a good question. I mean, we, um, we have for many years met together um, during my time at European Bio with uh, policymakers from different parts of the world who are active in industrial biotech. And I would say that there is a, a really widespread interest um, and you, the delegates, will be aware of that as well, coming from very diverse backgrounds as you do in, in different, uh, different countries around the world. But we've seen um, a lot of mobilization happening around the development of bioeconomy strategies and a real understanding that uh, industrial biotech is going to be the key enabling technology which uh, which produce or can result in more sophisticated, more resource efficient bioeconomy strategies that bring benefits to um, many different sectors and the environment itself. So for, for several years now, I think initially there was a lot of uh, focus around where steel was going into the ground, so where scale up was happening, where refineries were being built. And initially that would have been, I guess, uh, around uh, in, in the States, uh, occasionally in Canada, in Brazil, India, but China obviously has really uh, uh, embraced uh, industrial biotech as well. And we see, we see adoption all over the world, actually. So uh, it's, it's really something that seems to be mushrooming up um, and of course, across Europe as well, there's been uh, uh, many investments made there as well. So uh, plenty going on, that's for sure. Yeah, 
Um, so moving on slightly to bioplastics specifically, um, someone has asked whether you think the change requires top-down initiatives such as bans on plastic straws that many of us have been seeing, um, or should we look to grassroots attitudes to cause this change? I think it, it's really a combination of both. So uh, it's really difficult to introduce new products to consumers without um, the kind of grassroots uh, approach where you, you provide the information, you explain what the benefits are, you explain why alternatives are needed and, and what they can do. Um, but equally, for any small sector trying to uh, emerge onto a, an existing market, it's very difficult to do that uh, without some kind of incentives. Um, and the kind of incentives that we've been hoping for for a long time uh, with things like bioplastics is, is, is things like uh, public procurement, for example. Um, there's been a, a real need uh, to, to use things like public procurement to try and get new products onto the market. And it's been done pretty successfully in other parts of the world. So in the States, um, they've, done, uh, they've had a bio-preferred program for, for, for many years, which bring things like plastics onto the market. Um, then uh, it, it, when you have a, a government initiative that helps highlight the benefits of a bioplastic, for example, um, it really can help uh, with the whole process of, of, of bringing, it, bringing it out. And in Italy, for example, they've had a, a great deal of success in the Milan area in terms of um, collecting uh, bio-waste from, from households, so um, your vegetable peelings and, and the organic waste that you would normally chuck in a black bin bag, let's say, um, and would go into, into landfill or incineration. The, the idea of a government initiative to encourage people to use biodegradable bags that collect this waste, get collected, go into industrial composters, produce compost that, that, that can then go back uh, to improve soil fertility. And it's really been a, a huge success, but it's been a total integrated effort and a discussion that happens with people all along the waste management uh, collection chain. Um, so uh, we, we talk as well with, with many companies, um, members um, and non-members who are, are making, let's say you could say uh, compostable um, cutlery um, for uh, festivals, uh, sports events and things like that, where there's big volumes um, that can be collected and composted. Um, and there they, they employ all kinds of different um, initiatives to have volunteers out talking to people so that they can explain you know, what the products are, where they go, what the benefits of them are. Um, but it, it definitely involves uh, top down and bottom up. Yeah, and I imagine there's um, a lot that we can learn from each other as well in terms of, like you mentioned, certain countries have certain initiatives um, yeah. Yeah. and to, to deploy those more widely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's, 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 really, um, it's really important to kind of, uh, when, when we're talking to policymakers as well, to think uh, not just of what is possible right now with the infrastructure that we have right now, but what do we want to be possible in future and and what are you know what are the what's the potential for innovation in in new sectors um i think there is a huge potential for bio-based plastics in the future in, in in a huge number of sectors but the the levels of innovation the levels of scale up um, are, are not necessarily there right now but that doesn't mean that we should kind of say well that they're, they're not there so but we're not quite there yet in, in some sectors, so we should just abandon it and continue business as usual uh, because there's, there's a lot more at stake than that, as we all know. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely something that's at the forefront of people's minds at the moment. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what the what is the implication in, of global water supplies for pursuing a bioplastic future? Um, in terms of kind of water intensivity or use I, of or uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, um, hmm, that's a very good question. I mean, obviously, um, water is something you have to take into consideration when you're using renewable feedstocks as well, because um, mm. you're you're going to be using uh, um, plant-based material a lot of the time that that requires water to flow. <laughs> so that's one aspect of it. Um, 
in terms of uh, end of life um, of plastics as well, one of the things that is, is particularly useful when it comes to compostable plastics is that they, um, where you have uh, plastics in contact with food waste, if you are trying to separate those um, and you would need uh, volumes of water to, to separate and clean and, and you could have a compostable alternative there, that could be something that would be quite interesting in terms of water efficiency as well, because those um, um, biodegradable compostable plastics can be composted with the food waste rather than going through an incredibly in, in energy intensive um, experience of either incinerating or cleaning, separating, washing, um, and then recycling. So I don't have any uh, figures that I can give you right now on comparisons, okay. but but there are definitely aspects that that would uh, enable greater efficiency in, in use of water. Yeah. Um, are you able to give us any examples of a large corporate that's made a major shift into adopting bioplastics in place of traditional plastics? Has anyone made that move yet that you know of? Yeah, I mean, um, there, there are some, some big examples. And one of the ones that, that happened a few years ago was uh, Coca-Cola with, with plant-based bottles. So Coke started making its bottles uh, partly with plant-based uh, plastics. And more recently, um, in fact, this week, Total Corbion, um, which is a, a, a joint uh, venture between Total, um, what everybody will know, and Corbion, which is a smaller biopastic company, has just started work on the production of the first uh, PLA, it's a polylactic acid um, pl plant-based plastic plant in France, which should be operational um, in a couple of years' time. So, um, so actually, I think it's 2024 that it's, it's meant to be fully operational. So there are people making big investments there, and that's a, that's a total, obviously, was a traditionally a fossil-based uh, uh, company that's moving into, into plant-based. But over the years, we've worked with um, many, many, many brands um, who are all looking into how to move towards uh, plant-based as opposed to fossil plastics, Lego, um, sports brands like like Nike, um, but there's also Ikea, there's, there's uh, Jaguar Land Rover, there's Toyota, there's many, many brands that are, have, been, uh, have been looking into the area. So it's definitely an ambition um, that uh, brands would like because um, I'm sure to a large extent, it's, it's part of their core business principles now, um, their shareholders want it, but also the consumers want it. So that's uh, many motivations for exploring and, and finding solutions. Yes, definitely. Um, and kind of on the line of encouraging businesses to go down that route, can bioplastics compete on the price with traditional materials and how can that price difference be improved? That's a good question. Now, <laughs> I think, I'm sure there are sectors where, well, I, I think there are sectors where um, it, they can compete, but I, it's, it's a bit of a, blank spot in my knowledge to be honest um so right. yeah so i i'm i would say that it's it's a challenge uh, definitely um at this stage because bioplastics represent still a really small part of the overall plastics market um so when you've had 150 years or whatever it is um to optimize um your, your process your conventional plastics process and you have it running, you know, on 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 rails since uh, since many 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 decades. Um, things can be done quite quickly and quite cheaply, um, and so um, yeah, it it is a challenge to 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 make uh, many different bioplastics um, as price competitive. But the more the uptake happens, the more the awareness uh, grows. Uh, the, the less of a challenge that, that will become. But it, again, going back to the first question um, of or the second question about um, what does it take and, and where, where, are the, where are the kind of barriers to greater deployment and uptake, um, when you have uh, a, a, a good political understanding of what the benefits can be, um, then it certainly helps uh, to shape a more um, innovation friendly framework that can help bring new products into the market. Yeah. Yes, thank you. 
Um, someone has asked whether you can explain the details between biodegradable and biocompostable. Um, and is there a difference in what the EU specifically is pursuing at the moment or what other global bodies are doing? Um, the way that we talk about, and it is, it, is uh, it can be confusing, I know, but, but basically biodegradable and compostable are the same thing. Um, so compostable is just the end of life of biodegradable and biodegradable is the property of, of that plastic. Compostable is the end of life of that plastic. So that's the, the, uh, the, basic, um, the basic principle behind it. Um, in terms of the standards and, and what other, other um, countries are doing, we have um, EN standards, so a European norm standards um, for compostability and biodegradability um, in different circumstances. So, so those are the ones that we um, abide by and, and that our members abide by. Um, it, it's it's a, an interesting consideration to think whether or not um, we could have uh, more globalization in terms of standardization and labeling as well. It could be something that would be um, maybe helpful in the future in terms of understanding and uh, awareness and acceptance of, of uh, you know, so if you're, for example, traveling around, difficult to imagine right now, but from one country to another, um, then, you know, you would have the same kinds of labels um, to, to help you follow the right end of life procedures. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a good, it's a good thought for the future. Yeah. Um, and, and talking about kind of labeling plastic, someone has asked whether you think we'll ever see edible plastics in the future. I think they could be they could be really interesting <laughs> as a as a resource sufficient uh, use of my uh, plastics. Um, yeah, I, I personally, I would. I'm not speaking on behalf of my association, but personally, I think that they they could be really, really, uh, really beneficial, really useful. Absolutely. It's not something that's in the pipeline yet, then. Well, I mean, I've only I've only seen and heard anecdotally of uh, of people trying uh, trying to use them and uh, trying to think of uh, novel uh, applications for them. So, as far as I'm aware, they they do exist. I don't know if they're commercialised yet, um, but I think it's uh, it could be really an interesting um, avenue to explore further. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Kill two birds with one stone. Get rid of our plastics and see the world. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so maybe just a question to end on then. Um, we, have an, we have an audience of exceptional and motivated biotech leaders of tomorrow. Um, what are the main challenges of the biotech industry that they should throw themselves towards? I mean, I, I think the main challenge, and you are perfect examples of how this challenge is being overcome, uh, it is it's communication, acceptance, and understanding. Um, I think biotech is such a, a difficult, abstract thing for people to get their, their heads around. Um, so I always think that the more uh, young people and young professionals can try to be inclusive of people working in other sectors, uh, working in a cross-disciplinary way as, as you do with GAP Summit, um, uh, explaining, talking, using social media uh, about uh, and, and humor and, and integrating uh, science with culture as much as possible is a way of, uh, of just being able to engage people whether or not they're your next door neighbor, your gran, uh, your local politician, um, uh, whoever it might be, your kids, um, I think I think we really can't communicate enough on how uh, science and technology like biotech, um, life sciences in general, will be super important in order to tackle the challenges that we have facing us and facing future generations. And the greater the understanding that we can generate, the greater um, potential there will be for us to find solutions and to get the kind of investment and support that the sector needs to be able to deliver what it can. So I would say, I would say communicate, 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 really. Yeah, there's definitely a theme that's been common, I think, throughout all of the gaps on the sessions before. It's just the importance of collaboration. Yeah. Um, and as we were saying before, Joanna, the importance of these cross um, interdisciplinary teams. 
Yeah, absolutely. Partnership is 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 really key as well. And uh, and I mean, we often get asked, you know, why do they do so much better in the states, um, for example, on the east coast and west coast than we do in other parts of the world in terms of uh, innovation, whether it's in, in biopharma or in other pharma um, and in other biotech areas. And um, I mean, sometimes people say it's because they're much less risk averse and that, I'm sure that, that plays a role in it as well. And sometimes it's just that, uh, that kind of cluster effect of having people with knowledge and enthusiasm and energy and uh, inspiration brought together in, in, in the same space. Um, so I think the more that we can do of that, the better as well. Yes, definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you've brought an industrial biotech perspective that we've not yet touched really on the program. Um, so it's been it's been really great to hear from you and about the, the work that you're doing in bioplastics. Well, thank you so, um, so much for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so it's time to close day four of Gap Summit now. It's flying by very quickly. Um, and we've covered a huge breadth of biotech spheres today, perhaps more so than we have on the other days. Um, so we began the day with the digital health revolution. Um, and I would like to thank the speakers who took part in that panel. Uh, so Dr. Michael Kapish, Dr. Aditya Nouri, Dr. Sara Kafur, Dr. Natalie Paknova, and Dr. Oliver Armitage. Um, so in that panel, we discussed the best of the digital solutions that have occurred as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we talked about the challenges and the impact um, and learned that how the success of digital health relies on the education, trust, accessibility, accessibility of the technologies, and importantly, the integration of these and the communication um, between different, uh, different technologies and different stakeholders in the space. We were then introduced to the gaps that can be addressed by plant-based systems. So a complete pivot away from healthcare. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Professor Sir David Balkum and Dr. Jenny Zhang for covering this for us, where we heard about alternative technologies that are often overlooked um, in plant-based technologies, but that they can actually be manipulated and adapted to cover applications in the medical sphere um, and to provide enhanced carbon sinks and in things such as power generation and biosensors. Um, we then, sticking with plants, uh, moved into what I guess people more traditionally think of uh, when we talk about plant technologies, and that's the agritech sector. Um, so we, I'd like to thank the speakers um, involved in that panel, um, chaired by Dr. Howard Janice Shapiro, um, and contributed by Chris Patterson, um, Benjamin Bolag, Thomas Batchelor, and Sui Dalhorn. Um, and in, in this discussion, we had both from the value of predictive models, the importance of digital solutions, um, and then heard about some really exciting, in, innovative cultured meat solutions. Um, and interestingly, the challenge there seems to come from not necessarily the techno technological advances, but also the slow, slow adoption um, and custom, consumer acceptance within this field. Um, and then finally, to end the day, we've moved into the industrial biotech sector, where we've heard about the, in, how the industry is blooming and how bioplastics specifically can help us move towards a more sustainable future. Um, so, as I said, a very wide breadth of topics today, um, and I hope many of you have been inspired to look outside of the field that you may traditionally have worked in so far, um, and think about how the skills that you've, you've learned and that you've developed um, can be applied in these interdisciplinary teams that we keep talking about, um, so that you may be able to contribute to something outside of your, your field that you're working in currently. Um, so with that, I'd like to close day four of GAP Summit. Um, we'll be moving into uh, networking on spatial now for, um, and I hope that some of our speakers are able to join us. I, I think Joanna will be there. Um, so please take the opportunity to speak to each other and our speakers as you have been all week so far. Um, and then just a, a note to highlight is that we're starting at a slightly earlier time tomorrow morning um, with a keynote from Sermene Pangloss from AstraZeneca, uh, which will be in at 11 a.m. BST, so an hour than we've been starting so far. Um, so please be here to enjoy that before we launch into the Voices of Tomorrow competition, which is something that I know us as an organising team and I know many of you as LOTs are very excited to hear about. 
Um, so thank you everyone and I'll catch up with you all on spatial.